all. This is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbeen.com. Welcome to one more show. So after nine days of absence or even more, thank you very much for, for letting me reappear and have a dialogue. And thank you very much, Paul, to be here today to take the very first lecture afterwards. So we will talk about the COVID stats and consistently changing COVID stats. And Paul, welcome and take it away. Thank you very much, Mobin. So uh, we'll see how well uh, the title was I guess, selected is at the end. You can see if, it, if you agree that things are changing in a consistent manner, but you know, basically inside of a range going forward. So the first uh, slide here, this is from our world in data and selecting these countries, uh, some of which, most of which we've had before and looking at uh, the, uh, looking at some numbers, South Korea was up. And so this is where the uh, number of countries are. We have South Korea and then way down, France, UK, Canada, Germany, India, Netherlands, and the United States. And if you remember, India and Netherlands are included because they had some peaks before. And so essentially we're down at the 400 uh, cases uh, per million uh, being reported. We can argue whether it's be reported accurately or not. And certainly uh, a lot of folks in the UK and the US and other places say that, uh, that they really aren't tracking it accurately, but if they're doing it consistently, we can see that there are relatively more cases over up here than there are down here and take a look at that. So here, this is also from our world in data, looking at the variants and looking at the diversity that we have. And this is the latest uh, data they had was from May 22nd, 2023. And if you go to our world in data and pick these states and the variants, you should see the same graph that uh, we have here. You can see that the, uh, we're having changes occurring and uh, there is different variant groupings in, that are leading in different uh, countries and different places where and and different um, different variants but but all of the disease overall diseases were relatively low for the same uh, places and you see South Korea was much higher and their numbers and the variants aren't that much different from say the United States or uh, Germany a lot different than India, but India is also very, very low. This was an old slide. And if you look back and forth, you can see that there's some changes. But to help you guys out, I pulled them all out. And you can see that uh, this said old slide on it. When I made the copy, I left the old slide. So you can see that the one with the some of the old slide lettering is the old one from the last time I presented. And you can see that there are changes consistently occurring in the uh, distributions. Some places like India, much greater shift than the United States, but still very significant changes occurring. And look at South Korea. Uh, their cases may be up because we're getting more of this, uh, what is this, uh, XBB1. Um, so, here are the other half of them because I couldn't get them all onto one slide because there were two slides. And again, just showing that we're getting changes occurring and they aren't the same, uh, but they're varying. Uh, the, the variants are varying uh, in each of the countries and the countries are being different from each other. And of course, inside the countries, they're different in different regions and cities and everything. So any questions or comments on that? So far, so good. And to the cool beans who are watching, please, if you have a question, put some QQQ so I can identify the questions. This is from the CDC website, and this is showing uh, the variants that they're tracking. And these are obviously, as we talked about before, BN1 is not a variant. It's a group of variants that are close together, and there's a number of changes. And then at some point, they decide that there's significantly enough different to um, call it a new variant or a class of variants, just like um, 
there was a discussion we had whether we call this uh, uh, COVID-3 when, when it changed enough, but they just decided not to do that. The uh, blue are the two that were added the last time that I talked that hadn't been there before. And these green are the two that the CDC have, has added since the last talk. So going back uh, about two months, we've only had these four, or we've only had these uh, what, five different uh, new variant groups, or maybe six. This this one is included. So we have six new ones, and we had four before, and now we're having two. So if anything, the uh, rate of new variants in the U.S. is not accelerating, and perhaps is uh, slowing down in the rate, but if we look going back to the original Wuhan here, we don't have that many different variant uh, groupings that have been tracked by the CDC. I'm using the CDC because I couldn't find anyone else that had a nice little graph like this where they're all related together. Not that I trust that they're absolutely right, but they're useful. Now, if you remember from the last time, um, there was a slide here that uh, if we go into the nextstrain.org and we have the little dots that are there, and if you click on a dot, you can actually get the analytical information here, which are these. Now, unfortunately, uh, they don't have a fixed format for it. So you can see here, this is the ACE2 binding versus the BA2. They didn't go back to the Wuhan, and we have a number here, and then we go up, and it's in a different order, but the same is shown here. And so the difference between uh, these two is is uh, significant, uh, going down and showing that the um, that the new variant is has less binding with the ACE2. If you look at the immune escape versus the BA2, um, they're essentially the same. Yes, I see. So again, you can look at this to quickly determine for a given a, a analysis uh, how much change and what sort of change is occurring in terms of the, you can project uh, whether there's going to be more immune escape, whether it's going to bind, and whether you think that will make a difference in how the disease progresses. So it's a, a, an extra degree of, um, uh, of analysis that we can go. And you've got the date and the, the clay that it's in, the host, of course, they're all going to be homo sapiens. And a, mo much, a lot of this information isn't very useful. I mean, you can find out where the sample was taken. And when we get to the point, I'll show you how to do this. And um, you can go and select which ones you want to take a look at. Got okay. it. Thank you. Now, this is South Korea. And if we take a look at this little bitty lump here, you notice it looked much bigger on the first one. That's just because the scale was. And so I wanted to show this is South Korea from the very beginning of the Wuhan. And one can suggest that isn't much of a peak. But if I go back up to where we started, it's the biggest peak that we are looking at. So now we go back down and we take a look at the slope. And the disease progression, uh, the slope will show you how fast the cases are increasing or decreasing. So first, let's look at the red. And we're starting to have a downward trend in South Korea. And I got as close to the line as I could. And you might draw a different line. But using this one and looking at the prior, the end of the prior peaks, clearly this one is much slower than we had at the, uh, for the first or the second or the third peak. I mean, it was what wasn't until it was way down here that the slope essentially flattened out enough. And so this disease is um, taking longer to go away, you know, the, the peak. So we're having more uh, people infected at a higher percentage of the peak, the peak's much lower, but at a higher percentage for a longer period of time. We're here uh, right before uh, March of 2020, uh, Two, we had a very sharp decrease where the number of cases fell off very quickly, and it isn't doing that. And if you look at the rise here, again, I tried to par parallel, and then each of the purple lines are the same. And you see it went up this way. Um, 
it went up much faster in the prior peak and extremely fast in this one and the very first peak much 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 faster going up so this appears that it's getting less virulent you know it's, it's infecting people slower and so it isn't reaching the saturation that everyone that it can infect is gets infected right away and so if it only infected one person a day then it would take however long however long you know if there's a a, a, a hundred thousand people in south korea that can be affected it'd take a hundred thousand days where if you had a thousand infected a day it would take 10 days for it to come down and so this is the sort of change that we're seeing going on with these that's people. very interesting very interesting thank you for putting those arrows on it that kind of clarifies even more right but but it, and, and you're welcome and so my takeaway from this is it's not something that I get more and more concerned that South Korea is having a more dangerous form of COVID that's going to go and take over the world or anything. It's just getting less and less virulent, which is exactly what you know, Moby and you predicted a long, long time before the data supported it. And if we go- A quick question from Mean Bean. Is RSV replacing COVID? It seems that pharma is promoting wax for it. So my quick answer, no, I don't think it is replacing it, but they are just promoting their vaccines as usual. Well, um, if, one, if, if, if one backed up, one might say from the pharma marketing strategy, maybe it's replacing it, but, but, but not from the <laughs> That's disease. A good point. <laughs> yes. Our good friends. Okay. And if we go back here, this is the India and I did the same thing, but there, at that point, it was only going up. I didn't have a going down for it, but you can see the same sort of thing here. You know, we had this prior, these last two going up at the same rate. So probably whatever is controlling the infection, and one can argue whether it's vaccination, hand washing, whatever it is, was pretty consistent in these last two and much different in all the prior waves. And, th th you know, this one being closer, the first one being closer, but the middle two just completely different trajectories for India which is different, but consistent with what we saw in South Korea, which is sort of the direction I'm saying is we're getting these differences and they're consistently different, but they're not, it's not like a cookie cutter where they're all the same. And, you know, you take a look and say, oh my gosh, you know, the, the first wave was the highest wave for everybody. No, that wasn't true for India. I mean, it's true for South Korea, but in India, it was the third wave that was the fastest rising, but not the highest. And so you can look at these, and I'm sure there are conclusions that people will, will draw from it, but I don't know enough about medicine to, or not have enough data to do that. Okay. Now we have the CCCP being consistent on their misinformation about COVID, and it continues. And here is the, underneath it is the uh, uh, URL that I took it from, which is uh, science.org and content article source Beijing's big new COVID-19 outbreak still mystery with dashes in it. And so China reported that they had no internal cases for 55 days. Then they had 137 cases that all that came immediately when they tested 356,000 people, or more than a few more than that in Beijing. And it's according to this news agency, and I can't pronounce their name. And so they immediately locked down some residential compounds. How they picked those, perhaps the ones that they tested that found the cases. They closed all the schools and canceled hundreds of flights. They shut down a massive wholesale market. And it, they linked it to the outbreak because and, and frozen fish from Europe. Isn't that kind of what the CCP claimed for the start of the Wuhan? Frozen fish from Europe coming in. But there's no European outbreak that it came from. And I think maybe it's tied to, CC, to give CCC plausible deniability and a reason not to be supporting the Russian war or something. I don't know. Anyway, they tracked it back to one man. Uh, the outbreak came from one man and he had no history of recent travel. And they thought maybe he or one of his close relatives visited this 112 hectare complex, which 2,000 stalls and 10,000 customers a day. So this is their conclusion that he caused that whole thing. And they found on a number of surfaces or fomites, 
uh, tested positive for the for COVID. So either it came from the complex or perhaps some of the 10,000 daily customers are infected and they just touch stuff and stuff gets infected. Now it's interesting to note that the genome of this new outbreak has been sequenced, but it hasn't been shared yet. So we, can't, so we can't tell whether the stuff on the fomite is the same or not the same or how many of these 137 people have the same thing or whether it's related to where the fish came from Europe or whatever. So uh, before we go to the next slide, one, it is actually amusing. Second, there are some interesting questions as well that I want to put to you. There may be answers later on, but l let me know when you're ready. I'm ready. Okay, so there is a question from Do uh, from Joy Fisher. Have the symptoms changed? Again, you may have them later on or you may not have them. No. I can tell whether it's my allergies or COVID. So, uh, Joy, this is actually happening to so many that sometimes just the, uh, um, you know, irritation in the eyes or sometimes ear uh, infections and sometimes upper respiratory uh, infections or sometimes just the itching on the skin. And this... Uh, is actually becoming the the newer variants are just becoming more and more human friendly and going more and more in the upper respiratory areas so that is a good news i just am more worried about they going towards the ear and causing tinnitus which seems to become permanent so right. we'll do and a separate talk and i can say i think i've had it five times and um it feels different and I, I'm not suggesting anyone get it, but I'm just saying when I get it, it feels different than in some ways. And I, I you know, I, how to explain it, I don't know, but it feels different than uh, influenza, cold, or allergies. And then when I take a little of the medicine that they don't want named, um, I feel much better. And I feel that's a confirmation that it's actually COVID and not something else for me. Yeah. So for, for me, the specific identifier for COVID is that for a couple of days, I become more, I become tired. And that I just become tired for a couple of days when I have the eyes itchy and some throat irritation, and that's about it. Sorry, but, back to you. But, this going was to, one. but going back to the question, uh, are we hearing that the symptoms are changing at all with these late, latest variants or whatever? I've heard nothing saying that the symptoms are changing, that it's it's not all upper respiratory and very consistent with uh, um, um, allergies. Yeah, and I, I would actually go find some more data on this one and present it, Joy. Zen Zen Chi says, I have friends in China. They say second peak is already there. I, so, I don't doubt that it's there, but I think it probably had been there all along and just hadn't been reported. And certainly the people in China that aren't infected, if they see the government shutting down all the schools and doing things, that would tend to make it sound like it just happened. J Janet is saying um, uh, those frozen fish need to be vaccinated to keep us safe. So right, I but, think did, didn't, but didn't the head of Moderna say they never ever looked at vaccine to stop the spread of the of the disease? They didn't even question it. They have no data to support that. They just have true. politicians saying that. That's true. So with this, back to you. <laughs> uh, comment responding to what you you Mobin put out there: the FDA withdrawing the uh, J and J vaccine authorization. That will also mean that J&J &J will no longer have to collect data, will no longer have data available, and nobody will track uh, the vaccine injured from J&J &J anymore. And that is the, so I intend to talk about this, that this week. That is the bad part of this all, that people who are injured by J&J, &J, they, it seems like they will not have uh, access to data and access to the information through Freedom of Information Act and so on. That I think is bad. I have to dig through this to see if there is an avenue for them or it is just closed. Well, and that you, you, would be they can always sue. And once you get a class action suit, which means five to 10 years down the road, you start to get data from J&J. &J. Yeah, but yeah, injured are injured at this time. Right. So they will get some data. They still can. And J, whether J&J, &J, oh, yeah, we threw that all away when we didn't need it anymore, whatever. 
one of the things that they probably should do if people are concerned is to send a letter, uh, get a lawyer to send a letter threatening litigation, because once litigation has been raised, then uh, if data is uh, destroyed in at least most jurisdictions, there's different rules to deal with how you deal with how you deal with data that's been destroyed. And to typically, sometimes they allow the other side to make up data and pretend it's real to keep people from destroying really bad data because how bad, however bad it is, the other side can invent something even worse. Agreed. So John says no data. And then um, Trizzy, Trizzy says, is one word herb safe to take for long COVID? Uh, Trizzy, from my point of view, I'll have to work on it. But I know that one of the um, one of the substances coming from it has been thought to be safe for co uh, protective for COVID, but we can do a separate discussion. And uh, Purple Diamond says, I still would love to know how I've managed to never get COVID, even though I've been directly exposed by family members. Three were contagious while I was visiting their homes for two weeks. I think we both can put in our comments. My comment is that there are actually people who never develop it, and there are researches going on. One in San Francisco, one I know is in Canada. I'm sure many other studies are going on too. Well, you have the same thing with lung cancer. Some people smoke unfiltered cigarettes all their life and never seem to have a problem, and other people, it seems like secondhand smoke gets them. So, you know, yeah. That's one of the problems with, with biology, and, and particularly the, the stuff I've seen where you're doing biological monitoring of something. You know, it's so easy, relatively speaking, to impact or kill the first and so hard to kill the last. They use an LD50 where 50% of the population is impacted, which tends to be fairly consistent or as consistent as we can get. And so if somebody is in the 10% or 1% that is immune, the other thing could be is that you've had it and you've had a uh, uh, you've had it without any uh, symptoms, and you could have had it and had your um, uh, innate immune system beat it off, and so you don't have any um, uh, antibodies or any evidence of having the infection. So, you know, I, I don't know how someone would know if if you just happen to have the fine tuning of your innate system such that when it showed up, it just was wiped out right away. I don't know how you could tell the difference between that and someone who never got it at all. Agreed. Uh, very interesting uh, question. Quinn says, Pfizer forced to pay a record 2.3 billion settlement for widespread drug fraud, September 9. I'll have to read it up. Of course, it is an interesting headline. Uh, um, Paul, did you come across this? No, I haven't seen it, and I don't want to say anything that would be um, uh, damaging their reputation, but a number of folks have criticized uh, businesses for doing stuff and paying small fines. Uh, hopefully, if they're being fined for doing something, it's big enough to give them a big business incentive, uh, as well as a moral and legal incentive to do the right thing. And, and I have to assume without knowing anything that the judge set an appropriate uh, fine for that and that uh, whatever activity occurred wasn't authorized by their government governance you know the, the board and the governance people and they will stop them from doing inappropriate things in the future so I, I don't know but i just hope it's done right and that it will encourage people to do the right thing going forward got it uh, just one more question uh, and then we move with your slideshow. <laughs> David says, don't you worry about all the studies on organ damage with repeated infections? So a uh, couple of answers to that. Repeated infection and damage for some people is going to be bad. And yes, they have to figure out how do they protect themselves. And there are some people who just uh, repeated infections are actually becoming milder and milder and milder. For example, for myself, I don't even notice now that there is an infection. In the beginning, it was really bad. So I think it really depends upon a person's own body habitus, their risk factors, their um, comorbidities, intensity, the type of variant, the vitamin D levels, the the uh, their lifestyle. So there, there are individualized factors that would determine what is the outcome. So yes. And, and that and that question really assumes that it is a pervasive infection. 
as you said, an infection is just an infectious agent in your body. If you get one that comes in and your body kills it right away, that's not going to cause any harm to anybody. And so someplace between there and dying from it is, you know, some can cause real trouble and others not much at all. Yeah, that's the problem with COVID that th there is. And this is the frustrating part about COVID that we actually do not know. We still do not know after three years that who is more at risk other than talking about some comorbidities. Back to you, uh, Paul. Thank you. Here's some CDC data. And once again, they've shifted the scales, moved the goalposts, eliminated some of the things that they were tracking and changed from current hospitalizations to total hospitalizations. And then they just tell us that the number has come down 11%. And then we have the total hospitalizations and then the number is down another 8%. So if these are true, uh, I assume they are, but now we're not given any data, almost as if they didn't want us to potentially check theirs and say, point out when they might be wrong or understand it. If we trust them, it's been going down by um, close to 15% uh, in the last uh, four weeks because they're now reporting on a two-week basis where they used to report on two weeks, but every week, and now they've gone to changed it and the death numbers and they switch the sides to sort of help facilitate tracking of them. They change the order around. And you notice in the month or so between these two, um, the number of people with updated boosters um, seems not to have gone up much. And you can see up here, if you want to get the URL, it's reported right there. Now, and this is from the CDC, and this is, uh, again, every two weeks. And you notice before we had a lot more lines, and now they're just it's doing the same period, but we're taking every other one out. So we're doing they're doing less work on it. They have, again, uh, marked clearly that this, this is the model, not the uh, real data. And so we're two, four, five weeks out from real data being reported. But these are the variants that they're showing for the last time frame here. Okay. And here, um, See, right here is the, uh, the week I went in and took from the prior one. Excuse me. I took the prediction that they had for this week. So here we have, this is the data they're showing, and this one is the data they predicted from two weeks before. And it looks like it's a pretty good prediction. Certainly a lot better than some of the comparisons that we've done. And this is the old slide and to remind you of all the numbers that they used to have that they ha are reducing the amount of data they're giving us and just pulling some of the stuff. So the steps become bigger and um, they, uh, the ability to sort of see if things make sense or not gets less and less as they go go to more pixelated data, essentially. Paul, Thank I'm you. becoming totally jealous that people really love your updates. <laughs> I have to <laughs> I have to do something. <laughs> oh, don't worry. I'm, I'm not competing with you at all. <laughs> so just happy that people are willing to listen to me. Uh, here's... This data they're, they're collecting, uh, first, these are the now cast estimates. So this is four weeks in advance, five weeks in advance of real data. Uh, it's for the regions that they have set up. And so I don't know that it really reflects what's actually going on in each region, but it's the data that's collected for them. And so you can see that there are significant differences in the pie shapes. 
And that's what this is for, is just to show that we're having consistent variation. And if we go into like even Texas, the difference between Dallas and Fort Worth or over in uh, San Antonio or go over to El Paso, we're going to have the significant changes in the variants that we have. But I haven't heard that there's any place where the disease is, is getting out of control. And as much as we have concern about the end of the um, the COVID declaration and immigrations coming in and immigrants coming in and not being screened or whatever, we're not seeing that the, the, the areas where they're impacting the most on the border that we're having very high rates of COVID. And I know there are people getting distributed all over the country for various reasons that you know, we won't argue whether it's good or bad, but they are now being distributed all over. I'm not hearing that New York City or Chicago or any of the other places where immigrants are being uh, bussed or flown into are having significant COVID problems. This is an interesting comment by Aisha. She says that I think someone need to cover the economy aspect of buying vaccines because some countries bought 10 times more than they need. It's an interesting uh, topic to discuss. Right. And then the vaccine has a limited life. So what do you do when the life is limited? And I know there was at least one story. And I think I don't remember the countries. So I'll say a country and, 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 and it'll probably be wrong. But I remember that someone had some vaccine that was two weeks from being expired and they waited until it was a week before it was expired. And then they offered it to a country like Poland and the Poles said, wait, I can't distribute that in a week. Well, why weren't you talking to me a month before this and get this set up, you know? And well, we thought we might need it for our people. And and, and we may like socialism or not, but that kind of behavior when you've got a, a year or two, I think it was a six month or year um, period, you, you ought to know pretty soon what's happening or not and figure out where it's going to go if it's not going to be used. But we had an awful lot of the vaccine that just expired. Yeah. Mean Bean says, any update on trials for mRNA flu vaccines? Good question. I have to do a separate talk about that. Do you have any uh, updates on this, Paul? No. Um, Next time. But then. I can tell you that uh, my personal response to that may be closer to my response to uh, the COVID mRNA mRNA vaccines versus the flu vaccines I've had before. But that may be my own personal choice. Okay, let's go to Zoe and the UK, not because we care about them more, but because they're reporting data and nobody else is the same way. So this is a very complicated slide, but let's focus on it. Here we have the current is coming down and whether they're right, wrong or indifferent, the numbers here, they seem to have done a much better job than the CDC of correlating and adjusting their numbers to fit what the um, Office of National Statistics comes up with their survey where they actually are going out and surveying random people. And they don't have a big concern with uh, illegal search and seizures and data privacy. So the British citizens are sort of thrown up against the wall and taking samples and going forward with that. And remember this, this number came down from above 4 million down to here and it's still down. I think that was one of the corrections they did. They left the curve the same, but I think they just moved it down and it's still where it was before. If you remember, um, I go to, to an old slide. Remember here when I made the prediction, it looks like it was coming down and even the low rate was coming down. Yeah. We had sort of a funny yeah. thing here, but we made predictions that this said, the bottom said four years till zero, and the top said, you know, nine months to zero, heading that direction, and it won't keep going. But we got the, we got an R value of putting in just the data points, the top data points of 0.93. Okay, and this is when there was 97 uh, 92,700, but going back up to where it is today with the same lines, I'm not really doing a correlation, but it's between nine months or six months and uh, four years saying that if everything keeps going and it won't, but that's the prediction, 
straight line prediction, we should be at uh, zero cases. And so they're both heading in a, a downward direction. And so we continue to do it. And as we add more, um, again, I moved the line up a little bit. So maybe it's gone, you know, another couple months to head down. But essentially, the slope of the line is the same. And you can see this new peak is very consistent with the downward trend. Certainly nothing looks like it's alarming or causing trouble and that they're the decrease uh, or less virulence has stopped or it's turned around and the disease is infecting more people or whatever. It looks like we're having a decrease in both the bottom and the top of each peak. And the so, magnitude of the difference between the folks getting infected each time is getting dramatically lower too. Go ahead. Thank you. Very quick comment. Uh, John 653 says, doing groceries while listening to our illustrious illustrious Paul, is lufimectin still efficacious on the latest strains of COVID? So, John, my comment on this one is that I'm hearing from some of my doctor friends that they're saying it is working, and for some, it, they're saying it's not working. To me, it seems like there may be an, a reduced effect because the virus itself has mutated, mutated a lot, plus it may be that the the usage has become so widespread that some people just are not going to respond to anything and they're because of their comorbidities and some people are just not going to have severe outcome even if you don't give them anything so i think we are in that kind of a mixture state with a more milder form uh i, I, can, I, can, tell, I, I can tell you from my experience it appears that it's between 60 and 80, probably about 70% as effective as it was before in terms of reducing the lower symptoms than it was the first time I took it. That's a rough guess, but still, I think it's very worthwhile. And looking at what we just talked about with the vaccines, the drug life isn't forever, so I'm not going to save it up and then throw it away. True. I have some. <laughs> So if we look at this, the downward slope, again, just like we did uh, with South Korea and India, this is the downward slope that we're having right now. And so the question is, how does this compare with the end of the last peak? Well, this peak was not nearly as down. Uh, you know, this peak was much more spread out, exactly the reverse of what we were seeing from South Korea, where the last peak was the most spread out. And this one is, is more... Uh, you know, more vertical. This one seems to be more spread out. So whatever was happening here seems to be happening to a lesser extent here than it did here. And so these various infections, and if we go back to some of these other, you know, these other uh, peaks, the rate of coming down is way different. And someone is going to figure this out and write a m marvelous elegant paper explaining what they think occurred in a country or each country looking at stuff. And if so, you're going to have some guy that's doing a, a series of PhDs or a series of masters under a PhD where they're going to say, oh, I'm explaining Pakistan. I'm explaining the US. I'm explaining this place. And all these curves will go in and someone will come up with something. It won't be mask usage or whatever, but they'll find some reason for that. And the same thing with the the same thing with the increase. You can see there's drastic differences here in the infections that are going on. You know, this this is is you know so much faster in these early peaks than what we're seeing right now in the UK. You got it. A very quick question. Uh, Thizzy says electroconvulsive therapy be safe and effective for long COVID. It depends who is going to administer and what is the reason. Um, if the neurology department itself is going to use it, then they have the correct protocols to understand in what, in what uh, situation, symptom set, and what kind of intervention. But if it is not in that department's control and it is someone sitting outside saying, I'm going to do this, then I would not suggest it. Back to you, Paul. OK. Um we are now at 41,000. Also, we're not at a peak or a trough. And in order to make the projections, we've got to be at a peak or a trough when I do it, because otherwise the, 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 the rate of cases. So I can't do a 
how long is the average case, you know, where I can say, okay, we had so many cases and, um, you know, taking a look at the, uh, the number of people in the hospital and figure out how many days it would take at that, re- that daily rate of infection. You know, again, I've done that number before, but I can't, it doesn't make logical sense to do it unless your data is at a peak or a trough, because otherwise the increasing cases or decreasing cases would, would logically throw that number off. But that's another way to see if the cases are changing. Not that it necessarily is a good measurement of how long people on average are infected, but it's a consistent measurement. And we could take a look and see if that is varying. But notice we're at 41,012 cases. If we go down to the uh, here, this last one, when I first did it, they were at 92,000 cases. So, you know, cut more than it cut more than in half. Quick response to Truth Seeker. So in last seven, eight days, so here is here is what was the plan. The plan was to take last week off to make TikTok videos because I'm going to change the shape of Dr. Bean's plans and courses and the things that we sell. And so we are trying to use other medias as well. The price is going to change from what what is the link in the description to 97 and then for various uh, plans. Uh, even more. But (laughs) last Saturday, my brother came over to visit us. And he stayed actually this morning at 10, 11, I dropped him at the airport. So that was just so much fun to be with uh, him. So we went out and we had lots of fun. And I didn't do anything. I didn't watch these. I had this in my mind. I didn't do anything, not even TikToks. So here we are. <laughs> my apologies, didn't follow up or do my homeworks. Back to you, Paul. Well, I'm glad you got to spend time with uh, with your brother. I actually had my Thank son you. come and visit me, so it was a good time for me as well. But if you see here, uh, we had the predicted num- number of people infected and the daily infection rate. And so this calculator is 13 days because it was at a peak. And so again, at each of these peaks or troughs, if we collect this data, we can do this calculation and get a rough idea is, are people being infected for a longer period or shorter period than before? And again, not saying it's a good prediction of the average, but it should be consistent across all the diseases in uh, the UK from their prediction of how many people have a case and how many are the daily to, to, to give a rough number or a, a measurement of that. So I, I would hope that somebody uh, down the road would pick that up and do that. And this data is all from uh, health study uh, at joinzoe.com slash data. If you just search for Zoe um, COVID data, it'll be one of the options, at least when my Google comes up, it's there. This is at the nextstrain.org. And these are the same ones that I've shown repeatedly before. Uh, They're estimating 30 substitutions per year. If you remember, they were up at 37. If we go uh, for a year and take a look, mm, you know, is that 17? Is that 18? Anyway, ours have been between about 15 and 18 the whole time and it's staying the same. And you can see maybe this slope is a little high, maybe it should be poked down a little bit, but I think that's about right. And we have the different colors here. And I picked all these nice reds to differentiate from other reds and they aren't going back, so. But if you take one of these dots and click on it, then you'll get the uh, that data that I showed you before, if we come up here. Where we compare these two. That's where this came from. So you go to nextstrain.org. And when you see all the dots, if you just click on like this one, it'll open up and show you all the data that was submitted. And you can look and they will say, you know, what is the uh, binding to the uh, um, to the site versus the uh, BA2. And these early ones may not do that, but all the later ones do and show their escape versus BA2. And so you can see the relative strength of binding and infection. Uh, that's binding to the BA or to the um, 
um, to the site. And again, there may be another site that is coming in or something else that changes it, but that just gives you a way to very quickly see if a new variant or a variant you're looking at, how is it different from uh, some, one of the other variants going back. And it's not easy to find this data, but I collected it for each of the, uh, um, each of the um, variants. Clades, I think they call them clades here, group of yes. variants. And, and so this, this, this is the name that I know, and they have all these. This doesn't mean anything to me, but I went and found it out. And the XBD16 is the last one that they have. They don't really have a uh, one that is past that. It takes them about a month to, get co to collect and have data coming out in this. Just like we heard, the uh, CCCP uh, in China has sequenced, but it hasn't distributed it. So the next strain, folks, aren't going to have that one. And if that's some different, different strain or the same one, there, there's no way to know. But each and one of these... question for you, Sadi. ...will also tell you, um, tell you if, uh, what the geography is of it. I have a dog. Uh, a couple of presentations ago, I had some pictures of dogs. You can go yes, look at the one that says puppy, and you can see pictures of my nice dog in there. Thank you for the question, but yes. Okay. Uh, we've been talking about excess deaths. Here's the latest from the Office of National Statistics. This is a very long... Um, URL, but if you just search for excess deaths ONS, it'll show up, at least mine did. These gray zones that they have are periods where they're saying that these high number of COVID deaths are raising the average uh, death rate. And so they're collecting it for five years and not adjusting it. Uh, France, I think, threw out the one year. Germany uses seven years. It's just different all over. And that's why I went you remember when I was looking at different countries, I looked at OECD, and uh, right after I did that, they stopped updating their data. So, um, okay. Uh, so, a quick inter interjection. Skyfrog is doing fighting words, <laughs> saying fight, <laughs> writing fighting words. Dogs are better than cats. No. <laughs> All right. I will leave it at this, and I'll go back to Paul. Hey, Sky. <laughs> uh, but but let's look at logically what Sky Frog said. He said dogs okay. and cats are different, and he prefers dogs. I think everyone can agree dogs and cats I, are different. And I don't think can... he said that. <laughs> Check no, out no, no, what he said. No, he said <laughs> I think he's saying dogs are better than cats. But logically, he's saying they're different, and he prefers one. I remember okay. I was in talking to a class of students and, 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 I, and we're talking about water and he said, well, water is great. And someone else says, no, well, <laughs> water is horrible. It's like, you're both agreeing it's different. You're just saying whether you like one or the other, you know? So, so when I said no, that meant that they both are different and I prefer cats. Right, exactly. Okay, so I think perfect. we can find more <laughs> yeah. agreement if we just separate the two and say, Dogs and Perfect. cats are different. Sky frog likes <laughs> dogs better. Okay. Done. Right. Fine. <laughs> and I have a dog, so you can guess what I think. But anyway. Oh, yeah. Of course you love cats, too. <laughs> yes. I love cats, too. So if we look at this, this is the gray zone right here, and it's cut off not because not because this is any different, but just my, my pace. I just cut it off right above to try to make it as big as I could. And if you look at the excess deaths in this time frame, they're saying that the COVID from uh, the prior year or years affected it adversely. But going forward here, I think it's clear that it's not a growing problem. And the difference that we have here is not as big as it has been before. So is there something going on? Yes. When we looked at the OECD, and I, if you remember, I picked that not because I thought the OECD was right but the oecd would be consistent from country to country they were reporting and so i wouldn't have to go back and say oh yeah france is using seven years and the uk is using uh, five years and germany is dropping out the COVID, you know and so it becomes much more difficult to try to draw a conclusion and we looked at it and said that there's an awful lot of um 
an awful that, that looks like there's excess deaths. And one of the things that I would want to do before I called for a health crisis is go back and look, you know, five years ago, six years ago, is this sort of over under normally occur where, where they go up and down? And, um, you know, the other number that is concerning for the U.S. is the average lifespan for the U.S. went down uh, during this COVID period. And uh, it's not all due to COVID. And there's lots of arguments what is going on or not. But it appears the can't say that the excess death uh, concern is wrong. But it does appear that it is continuing and not getting worse. It's not something that's getting dramatically worse. If you remember back in this time frame, it looked like it might just be continually getting a larger and larger percentage, and, and that does not appear to be true. We looked at uh, male, female, and uh, gender didn't appear to make a difference. And we looked at the age stratification, and while a lot fewer people died of younger at younger ages, which a lot of us are happy for, um, the effect was occurring through all age groups. Very quick question from Eddie Lex. Are there any blood biomarkers to look to see if the brain is starting to be affected by long COVID? So Eddie, um, depends what kind of effect. A few days ago, I did a talk about the biomarkers for neurological issues. So there were a couple of biomarkers that are specific to the neuronal damage. And those markers are actually done in neurology labs. So that is one. And these are blood biomarkers, so can be done with the blood drawn. And then secondly, it also depends what is the cause of the damage. Is it the mitochondrial dysfunction? Then maybe the mitoswap can be a good one. Um, the lactic acid can be a good one. Uh, the cytochrome C is a good test for mitochondria. Then if it is because of the clotting that the mitochondrial damage is occurring, then D-dimers and CRPs and other clotting fibrin type tests that are interesting. So it really depends upon what is the basic pathology we are looking for. But if we're just looking for the neuronal damage, then watch a video I did a few, uh, of course, now about two weeks ago, in which I posed the specific biomarkers that they were doing for checking the neuron damage. <coughs> Back to you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, these little dots on the bottom, those are bank holidays. So if the, the number drops down, it's because the bank holiday is going on. And not that uh, there's fewer people dying when the banks aren't in session, but I just think it's, it affects the reporting. So we have a question from Ruby. What about the excess deaths from midazolam, midazolams at the beginning of the pandemic? Are you aware of any such situation? No. So Ruby, I'll have to research. I'm not sure if I know this. Back to you. Long COVID. There's not much on it. So every time I find something when I'm presenting, I want to give you what little I have and what little has been shared. So here, this is uh, from a group, uh, kff.org. I have no idea what they were. They showed up when I did a search. And this is based on a uh, U.S. government survey here. Uh, let's see, I can't really read that. Uh, by the Census Bureau and the National Centers for Health Statistics. And they asked people whether they had symptoms of COVID that lasted longer than three months. So this is self-reported, okay? And they did it a couple of times. They did it in June, August, October, and January. And so these are the people that have ever had long COVID, but not currently having long COVID. And 16% of the people said they had. And you can see the numbers as we come down. And then we had fewer people later that had ever had long COVID than had long COVID before. And then we have more people that have had long COVID than ever had it before. And these are people who currently have long COVID, the reported they are. And you can see that the number is getting smaller. And so I think there's some hope here that whatever self-reporting is going on, they're showing uh, about a half reduction with the ongoing COVID going forward. But of the number of people that said they currently had long COVID, we had, went from about 19% down to 11% 
And so that's about a 50% reduction. So there was actually a Canadian study that also showed that the biomarkers for long COVID had reduced and gone away in about 50% of the population of long COVID patients. But there are still long COVID and vaccine injured patients who have no change at all. And that is what worries me a lot. So thank you for this. And a quick question, uh, Gold Country Russ says, how are questions asked if not in chat? Um, Gold, uh, I'm assuming that you're saying that our question asked of me, uh, the fewer ways, Discord has a very good set of uh, discussion that happens. I am usually absent there, but there is very good discussion happens and people help each other. Um, I do a by, I do two live Zoom sessions every Wednesdays, but these are only for those who are supporters on YouTube or Substack or Patreon. And then we just do discussions in which we do question answers as well. I present some topics too. So that is another way. I started at one time to have uh, just ask people that, hey, if you have any questions, let's do a Zoom and let's talk about it. And someone after that session reached out, reached out to me and said, I have following more questions. And I said, I cannot help you with those. I mean, they were just tons of questions. And they said, I would like you to answer to those questions. And I said, I can't. I don't have time for this. And they said, I will pay you for this. And I said, OK, so here is my hourly fee for doing this research. And they just become so upset. And so I have left it. So my doctor friends sometimes ask me to do research for them. So I've left it for them. But that is another channel as well which I have not done afterwards when I saw this person becoming so upset. So these are a few ways. However, when I receive emails with tons of questions in them or tweets, it's just very difficult for me to answer them. Uh, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of research. And I just don't have that time. Back to you, Paul. One of the concerns that I do have with this is that this data is self-reported. So this 11% or 50% reduction or 11% currently have long COVID, how much of that is that they got better and how much of that is that they're just putting up with it and have grown to accept whatever limitation they have? I don't know. And this should be a um, this should be an upper limit on how much better people are getting. I don't think it would understate it. But, but again, I can see if someone, you know, Let's say they had a, a headache uh, every night. You know, they might complain about it here a year later. They're like, yeah, that's, that just happens to me. It's not a problem. So then I took this data and um, took the U.S. population, the closest I could find, 334 million, multiplied it out, took this data and these percentages and just multiplied it. So we're saying that there's 53 million people. And we're coming up to 56 million. And we look at the change. It's uh, from before. We're having uh, 6 million people fewer that ever had long COVID than have it now. You know, the, the number is coming down rather than going up. And I drew these lines because you can see the 6.68 and whatever why are these numbers all the same? And this one is three, three, four. And this one, that's because I'm taking it's one percentage point. You know, it's, it's th these numbers, I'm, I'm really reporting too much. But I thought if I change it to 7 million, then that isn't really telling you what, what you know, it's hard, hard to, to, to pick the perfect way of saying this. But, you know, there's six, six and a half million people here that are, um, you know, reflecting this, the the, uh, the the decrease that's occurring, you know, we're, we're going from 63 million to 56. That's a two percentage point difference or 6.6 6 million people. And then we have another two percentage points and that's another 6 million people that are set up. And then if we go down to 11, that's a uh, four times that. And so that's 13 million people that um, currently are not saying that they have long COVID. And if we look at the people that ever had it, the percentage were the same. So that's a zero change. Here it's a decrease. And here it's an increase because we've gone from 15 to 17. And so that's saying that we had 
again, the same number because it's two percentage points of the population, says uh, 6.6, 6.7 million um, more people have ever had long COVID than reported it in October for the January. Yeah. Got it. That's that's what I have here. That's the end of it. Awesome. Thank you very much. And right on the dot for an hour. This is awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, how about we do a little, uh, we look at a few more questions. Once again, thank you very much for this data and presenting it, collecting it, putting it together. You are the best. Um, and of course, as you know, that Cool Beans really love your <laughs> presentations. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. You may hear my dog in the background. He has a squeaky toy. That is awesome. <laughs> I can hear it. Uh, so let's see. A few questions and then we break. Um, Dila says, Dr. Bean, wondering how your NP friend Sean is doing. Haven't heard you speak about him lately. I have to actually speak, uh, reach out to him. I would and then update here. Angela says, um, if ivermectin is for parasites, does that mean that wax contained parasites? No, no, it's a very different, it says cellular mechanisms we're talking about. And but ivermectin is not parasites. If I can, the, the, the question assumes something that isn't right, that a drug is for parasites. It's not. A drug does all kinds of things that could be useful for parasites. It's useful for other things, too. It's like if I, if I took my hand and I coated it with iodine, it could help fight an infection. It could also mark that I voted in a, an election or it could mark do any number of different things. Correct. It, it's a molecule. So, And that molecule is known to do anti-inflammatory things as well. That is why it is used for other things too. Denise says, no shit. <laughs> I think she was looking for wastewater <laughs> stats. Uh, the wastewater, they went back to the old way of doing it where they just show the percentage and it didn't show anything meaningful. So I, I left it out. But if you remember the last time I presented, they converted it over and they showed uh, the number of, uh, they had it in a more uh, useful way. And they went back to their old way of doing it where they had the, you know, the big black line that came down that showed uh that the uh, number of sites that were signed up was decreasing, but they weren't decreasing. It was just light because it always showed that shape and, you know, on and on. And so it's like, you know, if, if you're having 25, 30% of those that are reporting that aren't selected right, that aren't in any given time, how does it really show anything? So I looked at it to see if I thought that there was something alarming or, or, or settling and I didn't think it was worth my time. But thank you for remembering and asking that. So I want to show you, Cool Beans and their gratitude for your time. Janet is saying this. Um, Don A. Perry, Truth Seeker, Kim, Sky Frog. <laughs> yes, I, I think he would prefer the, the oil to be in some sort of fat that he could eat, like bacon fat. He likes bacon. Great info. Uh, I lolled at the dog needs oiling because it was squeaky. Um, right. And so he, he, uh, would, he would like bacon grease. That's <laughs> All the you're work. Quite well, so. You're all quite welcome. Thank you. Yeah, that was a good joke. That was the joke of the day today. Yes. So, Siddhartha, and as you can tell, everyone. So, Cool Beans, thank you very much for being here. Paul, thank you very much for being here, collecting the data, presenting it, giving me a day of break and chat. So, thank you, and I would see everyone tomorrow. Very good. Good night, everybody. Bye.